an abstraction. I mean, it happens thousands of miles away. Uh, it's fought in countries that we never see. Uh, it involves, you know, I mean, people who we never have to come into contact with. I mean, with drones and and, and you know and cruise missiles and other uh, uh, remote uh, weapons. I mean, it becomes even more abstract at this thing. But our film is an attempt to go to the other side of that whole military media apparatus and see the war as it's uh, experienced by the populations that live it on the ground. Um, so, um, yeah, and once you do that, I mean, once you once you see the Afghans on the ground as human beings, you're not looking at them, you know, from 20,000 feet through the crosshairs of, a, of, a, of an aircraft, but you're, you're in their living rooms sharing tea with them and talking to them. I, I, I mean, it, it, it never looks the same to you. Has something fundamentally changed in American values, in the culture, when we see on television, we see in films, uh, Tarantino's new film, kill is entertainment. And then we hear the president speak, or we hear the head of an intelligence committee, or we hear a character in a major film like Zero Dot 30 say, kill and bring him back to me. Do you think that that has changed how we view ourselves and our sense of justice? I mean, I, I think that the, the war and the violence of war, uh, I mean, changes us as a country, even in, even if we don't recognize the way that it's doing it. Like, the Iraq War, um, it, uh, I mean, I, I was a... I went over and became a war correspondent initially to cover the Iraq War. I, and every time I, I, I flew back from Baghdad to New York, I thought I would arrive and find a country that was engaged in a lively debate about the war. I thought that would be all that anyone would be talking about. That would be the only thing that was on television. Uh, and, and, it was, and it wasn't. It wasn't at all. It was ignored. It was as if there wasn't a war happening on the surface. But underneath that, it, it, it affects the culture. I, it, I think it seeped into our, into our consciousness. I mean, I felt walking around New York um, after coming back from Iraq, this this guilt and this and this anger that was just very difficult to, to, to work through and, and, and get rid of. And I think, um, you know, I mean, it's also different now in that uh, when there was a draft and everyone had to go and fight uh, from every class of people, uh, there was a very different experience of the, of the violence and loss of war. And there is now when, uh, when most of the soldiers come from a, a specific socioeconomic class, sort of a geographic area. And so that, so that, you know, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, I don't know, I mean, there's no one in my immediate social circle who, who knows anyone who's, who's, who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, who had an immediate experience of the war on the ground. So, but, but even if, even though it's not, um, even though it's not talked about, even though we don't know people who are immediately part of it, 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 that violence seeps into our culture. What do you hope with dirty wars to actually accomplish? What's that? What do you hope with dirty wars, your documentary, to actually accomplish? Well, I think, I mean, these, the global war on terror... Is this yours, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you look like this so baby. <laughs> Uh, the global war, war on terror is the longest war in American history, and uh, it's killed hundreds of thousands of people, yet we know almost nothing about it. it I mean, these wars continue because because they're secrets. Now, there's a reason why they keep them secret. It's because it's so that uh, because I think the American people would be outraged if they knew uh, what was being done in their name around the world. And so we hope more than anything that that dirty wars will make these invisible wars visible, so that so that there can be uh, you know a, a discussion of knowledge of what. Of, of, uh, of the wars that are being fought in over 70 countries in our name but that we know nothing about. In Iraq and fragments, um, the filmmaker attempted to show the people in the way that you do in your film. Did, did that film have any influence on you? Uh, Iraq and fragments? No, I knew James. Like, James actually, uh, Jackie, my wife, was wor uh, working in Baghdad uh, for years, uh, for a year, uh, when James arrived. And, you know, I knew him in Baghdad. They, they hung up with him in Baghdad. And Iraq and fragments was, was beautiful, uh, I think. It was beautifully filmed. Um, uh, and, and I think. I think in a way that, that our country wasn't ready to, to, to look at, at the war then. I, mean, I think now, um, I mean, 10 years have passed since 9-11, uh, and you have a, a moment in which these issues are bubbling back to the surface culturally. I mean, Zero Dark Thirty is out, there's Manhunt here at the festival, there's our film. There's a, a, a debate is, is I, I hope, finally going to emerge about about this war. Um, I mean, that we're finally going to be able to confront it collectively. One last question. 
uh, Jeremy Scahill uh, is sort of the voice of the film, and I wondered at what point you settled on that, and at what point he allowed you to settle on that. Yeah, it was a. It took a long time. I mean, Jeremy's a serious, a serious reporter, uh, uh, a meticulous reporter who never uses the word "I" in a in a, in a magazine article. It's all, you know, just the facts. It's straight out. Um, but. But we came to realize, um, you know, I, I halfway through production, maybe maybe in Yemen, uh, that um, I mean, two things. First, that that you know these these stories in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia, they they seem hopelessly remote uh, to, to people back home. Uh, that they uh, uh, that the people, it's hard to make them seem relevant, to make the people seem real. But Jeremy is real, right? I mean, the, and then Jeremy provided a sort of a window and a point of access, to allow the audience to get to know these families through his uh, through his character and his journey, um, and um, and so and so we needed him for that. We also need a need a strong narrative arc to tie these places together and make it into into a coherent story. So uh, finally, he was convinced of the of the absolute necessity of having the film to show the two sides. Well, I hope that people see your film, see Manhunt in terms of, of the Bigelow film, because the Bigelow film is a narrative film about real events. Yeah. Your film is a real documentary. Manhunt is a real documentary, too. Have you had a chance to see Manhunt? I haven't been able to, you know, it's been so crazy this festival, I haven't seen Manhunt yet, but I need to before I leave. I found Zero Dark Thirty. And Zero Dark Thirty, have you seen Zero Dark Thirty? I have, yeah. And what was your first reaction? Your first, if you could go to that place? Well, I mean, it's a, uh, um, uh, we know we're flooded with information about one night raid, about the night raid that happened on May 2nd, 2011, where Bin Laden was killed. We know everything about that raid. We know, uh, we know how many SEALs were in the helicopters, we know what kind of helicopters they had. We know the make of the rifles they carried. We know that they had a dog with them that was a Belgian Malinois named Cairo. We, we know everything about that raid, but in 2011 there were 30,000 other night raids. Uh, there were 300, 300 a month, in, uh, so more than 30,000 probably, but that, the actual number is classified. 30,000 night raids. So this this one instance uh, is not, uh, you know, it might be a compelling story in itself, but it is not the story of the war on terror. It is, uh, uh, and in fact, that, I mean, being flooded in details from that distracts, I think, from from the, 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 the bulk of this war that is being fought completely in the shadows. So it's called JOSA? What is the name of the... JSA, the Joint Special Operations Command. And I, I learned more about that in watching your film than anything I had read and watched before. And I, and I thank you for that. But who does JOSA report to? Who does JSAC report yes. to? Well, so that's the thing. JSAC was formed after the uh, uh, after Operation Eagle Claw, the failed uh, hostage rescue mission in Iran. Um, uh, it, as a you know, to be an elite hostage rescue force that uh, you know, a force that did specialized things, hostage missions, counter proliferation, nuclear missions, but that was not part of the military chain of command. It was responsible directly to the president and to the executive. So it is literally by statute the executive wing's private army. It was on, on September 11th. There were maybe eight hundred guys, a thousand guys in JSOC. Now there are, no one knows, tens of thousands. Now now this tiny force whose purpose is to do surgical precision strikes and take out the most high value strategic missions for the country, for, for our government is now kicking you know, in the door. I just want to interrupt for a moment. Yeah, of course. You use the word take out. Yeah. And I asked the question about kill. Ah. So is take out a nice way of saying kill? Uh, yes. And how does, I mean, you're, you're a new dad. Yeah. I mean, all the children are going to be growing up with this kind of value system. Yeah. Does that, what does that mean to you? How casually you said take it. It's yeah. not a criticism. It's not a criticism. Yeah, no, 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 I know. I know. Um, you know, one of the, the, the things that happens when you're with, when you, you know, filming with these guys, these units. Were you embedded? Oh, yeah, I was embedded often. I mean, I was embedded and unembedded, but, but there are parts of the story that you absolutely can only get if you're embedded. Um, so, uh, so, I, so I had to be embedded. But, um, I mean, you, you start to absorb their language and the way they talk, and it just, you know, it becomes the same vernacular that you use. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't actually like to talk about having a daughter. I mean, about my family. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's, it's okay. I'm just talking about the children. No, no, exactly. Uh, the children of our culture. Yeah. The children of your generation. Yeah. 
just grow up hearing on television words like take out, yeah. you know, kill, and I, I just, and I, I walk away from all of these films with this queasy feeling in the bottom of my stomach yeah. that something very seriously has changed in our value system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's a, it, it does change you. I mean, it changes you to, to see the horrible things you have to see as a, as a world correspondent. To see, to see corpses, to see dead babies, to see violence, to see that pain and suffering. I mean, it, um, there are... There are, I mean, the, the image of Tamana's face from Afghanistan, I'll, I'll never, like, get out of my head. Um, and, uh, but there is, a, I mean, you get, you get, Do you, do you think we will ever win back the trust of the people, the citizens of Afghanistan and Iraq, just those two countries, after what we have done militarily to them? Uh, no, no. I, I, I don't think it's possible. So where does that leave America? Uh, I mean that's a that's a question I think we all we all have to. Come. And that's a question I think that is in your film. I mean the question that Dirty Wars raises, at least for this viewer, was what are the consequences, the long-term consequences, not this immediate precision, take in, take out kind of procedure. And, uh, and so I really appreciate that you spent the time and took the risk and brought Scahill into this picture. Thank you very much, Mr. Raleigh. Thanks so much.